Truth tells us what love is. But truth by itself is a cold, hard thing. We need both. Today we're talking, we're going to be discussing a difficult, hard topic. Oh, Dan, unlike usual Sundays, though, it's in the material. Last week, it was, the topic was why religious people don't like Jesus, or if they do, it's because they've remade him into their own image. Uh, here's why religious people don't like Jesus. Today, the topic is how to be happy. Well, the message is the path of happiness, God's message to you. And right now, you're thinking, oh, I like that. Can, can Teach me how I can get my goodies, because that'll make me happy. This is what's difficult. Jesus has a different different answer on how to get there than we generally do, than I generally do. And again, I want to confess ahead of time, and I spoke about this in Sunday school class too, the message is far greater than the messenger. And sometimes I preach to you things that I know are true and that I've experienced the truth of in my life, but I am not able to hold on to all the time. And so uh, I want this for myself. And I want this for you. And brothers and sisters, I, I see us hurting sometimes. And I see us struggling sometimes. And I know today's, listen, today's message is the answer. Today's message is the answer. And I want to see victory in our church. And I want to see victory in our lives. And I want to see more happiness and more celebration because of how good God is. And we... We're often living defeated lives because we set aside our faith and try to do it by our own strength. I can't do it. None of us can do it. How to be happy, and unfortunately, maybe, it's the opposite of what you think. We're going to talk about living a victorious life. It's the highlight of Christ's preaching. This is the highlight of his, his preaching, the path of happiness. I'm going to take a look at Luke's version of the Beatitudes. It would be impossible for me to overstate how challenging, how counterintuitive, and how brazenly, brazenly countercultural Christ's message is. This message is revolution. This message changes everything. This message is so hot, it melts away our, everything that touches it. It's so hot, most Christians, myself included, we don't want to touch it. We don't. We say, I love you, Jesus. I want to obey you. I want to follow you. But we don't. We want a Jesus who fits in our pocket. We want a Jesus who does, he's like a vending machine, and we push the right buttons and we get what get out of them what we've already determined is best for ourselves. Christ's message is a, he shatters the world's expectations. And when we are worldly, we get caught up in that shattering. Lord, please be gentle when you shatter us, right? You've been there, right? When God had to work with you and it was kind of devastating. But but it's for our best. Basically, this is what the Sermon on the Mount, it's called Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. Here it's called the Sermon on the Plain, or the word could be plateau. So it's either, it's one of two things, right? It's because Luke's version is a little different. So either either Luke is talking about a different message, but Jesus used a lot of the same message because he's talking to different people, or it's the same message that Luke has condensed, he's made it a little shorter, and uh, Luke is saying they were on a plane, a plateau, which or a plane which was on a mountain, I don't know. So it's 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 more than likely a separate message, but some scholars think it's uh it's either it's the same exact situation in the in the word should be translated plateau here. <clears throat> on this Sermon on the Plain, on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, basically God comes down from heaven. And this is, this is beautiful. In Matthew, we see that this is the message that Jesus was waiting to give. And so you have all the Old Testament, and God's giving these powerful words, these powerful truths, what the people needed to hear. But when God himself became flesh, he came down and gave us the Beatitudes. Basically, God comes down from heaven and declares, you're doing it wrong. And here's how you ought to do it. Brothers and sisters, if we can withstand the humidity and the distractions and the 
in the heat this morning, I believe the Holy Spirit will work. You know how I know that? Because he's already working in me. So it doesn't matter what happens out there. It's already been fulfilled. Uh, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to work today. And brothers and sisters, if we cooperate with God, he can work in your life too. The Holy Spirit can do something in our lives today. And when the Spirit convicts us and he challenges us, Satan becomes fearful. And that old enemy doesn't want victory in your life. He will be at work this morning. You can be sure. It's not just the Holy Spirit. The devil is going to try to snatch away what we have for us this morning. And when we listen to him and not to the Spirit, we work against our own good. We rob ourselves of being able to know the joy of forgiveness, the joy of being teachable, the joy of growing, the joy of learning. Because we tell ourselves lies that rob us of this joy. And if we numb ourselves to the Holy Spirit or start to stare too long into the abyss of human depravity or our own wretchedness, there is no joy, and we lose the joy of our salvation. Someone once challenged C.S. Lewis. They told C.S. Lewis, you don't like the Sermon on the Mount. You don't like the Beatitudes. Here's C.S. Lewis's reply. As for caring for the Sermon on the Mount, if caring here means liking or enjoying, I suppose no one cares for it. Who can like being knocked flat on his face by a sledgehammer? I can hardly imagine a more deadly spiritual condition than that of a man who can read that passage with tranquil pleasure. In other words, Jesus Christ is bringing the hammer because he loves us. And he brings the hammer and he says, and here's how you can be happy. Because when he says, blessed is the man, blessed is, you know what that word bless means? It means lucky or happy. Jesus Christ brings a hammer because he says, all this stuff you built up, all the preconceptions, all the way you and I think, it's detrimental to our blessing. It's detrimental to our happiness. And Jesus Christ brings the sledgehammer. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be bringing the hammer, bringing a challenging message on how to live a life led by the Holy Spirit. Because, listen, a life of blessing, a life of joy, a life of victory. And I wanted to give us some encouragement first. So this week in Neighborhood, Cameron talked a little bit about Neighborhood, but Ephesians chapter 6.13, God tells us, For this reason, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to stand your, day on the evil, stand your ground on the evil day. And having done everything, stand. For this reason, put on the full armor of God, Trust in the Lord, not ourselves. Trust in His Word, not ourselves. Live out our faith, not live out selfish ambition. For this reason, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand on the, when the evil day comes. The evil day, that day when depression hits us. That day when disappointment hits us. That day when our dreams are not fulfilled. That day when our friend betrays us. That, that day when, when things didn't work out at work the way we were promised, the way we anticipated them working. That day when the dog gets hit by a car. That, that day when we get the phone call, we've always been dreading and we can hardly bear to, to listen to the end of the conversation. That day when difficulty comes thundering down on us, you better have that armor on. Stand your ground. And after you've done everything, the Bible says stand. In other words, don't give up. Don't run away. Don't give in. And I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, Life can be hard. You ever feel like you don't measure up as a parent? And letters like that one Megumi wrote kind of help. But, but I feel like that a lot. I even tell my kids sometimes, I'm not even sure how to be your dad, how to father you. You've got to help me with this. We can... We can feel like we don't measure up as friends. I'm not as good a friend as I should be. I should have been there for that person. I should have been there for that person. I should have been there for that person. And we let them down. We let ourselves down. I, I'm not the Christian I should be. I've never been the pastor I should be. We beat ourselves up. I don't pray enough. I'm not holy enough. I don't always worship completely the way I should. Sometimes I'm distracted. I stand in the house of God and people are worshiping, and I'm not. And the angels are saying, well, what's wrong with you? Can't you just get over yourself for a moment? Just for a moment? 
worship the Lord. Maybe after years of struggle, patience is still a struggle. After years of struggle, we still have to watch the words that come out of our mouths or the attitudes that we harbor deep down inside. We know we don't measure up. But here's the thing. I'm talking to my brothers and sisters in Christ. You are still standing. Well, Pastor, you don't know how I've been beat around. You don't know how down I... You are here this morning. You are still praying. You are still believing. You haven't given up on the goodness of God. You haven't walked away. You haven't, you haven't thrown away your Bible and ran right into the arms of the world. You are still here. That means no matter how hard you've been beat up, no matter how far you feel down like you haven't measured up, you're still where God wants you to be. You are still standing. Brothers and sisters, I want to affirm you. I want to encourage you. Yes, we know we're not where we should be. You know, that's, part, that's why it's a process. Let's not give up on that. But brothers and sisters, the devil is not happy that you're still reading your Bible. You're still praying. You're going to Bible study. You're going to church. I know we're not all we should be. But the devil is not happy you're here this morning. Stand. And after you've done everything, you keep standing. And you are. You are. You are still standing. That's why you're here. Praise God. That's a hallelujah. Don't throw in the towel. Don't wallow in discouragement. Stand on the word of God. Believe in God's grace. You believe in grace? You believe in grace? Is it just, I believe in grace. <laughs> All my sins are forgiven. I am, there is no condemnation for me. There is no condemnation for me. God, the blood of Jesus Christ has taken care of it all. You believe it? And we don't want to well, wallow in defeat. Stand on the word of God. God's grace saved you. If you're a Christian, God's grace got you this far. Amen? And by grace, he is going to bring you home. And he's going to finish the job. And it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. All right, let's begin our study of the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6 by turning to Matthew 5 from verse 3, and we're going to read the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, what do we always say? The attitudes that should be. <clears throat> Remember, in Matthew, this is Christ's first public sermon. This is God. All these thousands of years sending the prophets, but when God comes himself in flesh, this is the message he brings for us. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, the word blessed here means lucky or happy. Happy is the person who's poor in spirit. And we said, that means like spiritually bankrupt. I know that there's no spiritual strength within me. Blessed is the person who's poor in spirit. Well, isn't that counterintuitive? Shouldn't it be? Blessed is the spiritual superstar. Now, Jesus comes up, and the first thing he says to these people, listen, you're going to be happy if you understand this. Understand you are spiritually bankrupt. And if you get that, you trust in me, this, the kingdom of heaven belongs to such people. Blessed are those who mourn. Not just, I'm a sinner, deal with it. This is my attitude, deal with it. This is the way I am. I can't change it. But people are broken over their sin. I hate this in me. I, I, I hate the way I treated that person. I, I hate that I get so critical and so judgmental and all this stuff. I'm broken inside. The person who is broken over their sin, you're going to be comforted because God's not going to come over to you and say, what is, are you still struggling with that? What is wrong with you? He's going to say, it's going to be okay. I've taken care of that. If you're broken over your sin, you will be comforted. Isn't that beautiful? God comes down and this is what he wants to tell us. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Not the arrogant. I've got it all together. I'm a super Christian. I'm super religious. I'm super holy. The meek, the humble, they're going to inherit the earth. This is how we do Christianity. And have you noticed yet the name of the title of today's sermon? The path of happiness. God's message for you. This is how we find happiness. Not in the stuff we accumulate. 
not even when everything's going the way we think it should go. If we follow Christ's words here, you could be rotting in a prison cell in Vietnam or someplace. If we're following these things, we will find our peace and our joy with the Lord, regardless of our circumstances around us. I believe this, not because I'm all that, but because I believe the words of Jesus Christ. And I know in my own life, when I do follow the Lord, it's better. And when I get distracted by Dan Wolf, it doesn't work out. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I pray this, Lord, let me be hungry for righteousness. Righteousness means goodness. I want to be hungry for what's good. I want to be thirsty, Lord, for, for, for your holiness. And God says, you will be satisfied. Is that what's in your heart? Do you want that? It's coming, brother. Sister, do you want that? It's coming. Jesus Christ is, is going to fulfill all of that. We, we are hungry for goodness. We're thirsty for goodness. And guess what? He's not going to give up on you, and you will be good. And you won't have that shadow of darkness. You won't have that selfishness. You won't have all those struggles and temptations and that deal with that pride and all those things. We're going to be good. We're just going to stand before Jesus and praise him, and there won't be that inner struggle of light and dark anymore. If you are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, you will be satisfied, and God wants you to know it. That's why he came down with this message. Blessed are the merciful, because they will be shown mercy. Don't, don't tell me how much you believe when you say, I'll take God's grace, and you turn around and you can't give grace to other people. When you're hard-headed and critical of other folks, that's Christ is saying, let's live out our faith. Be merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. We're talking about holiness and purity. For they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. We got a lot of troublemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children of God. Blessed are those. Happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Have you caught some flack from your family? Why are you going to church all the time? What is wrong with you? Why, why don't you have nicer clothes? If you weren't putting money in the offering plate, you could have more, you know. What's wrong with you? Why are you always talking about Jesus? Why don't you just shut up? Nobody wants to hear that. We don't need another church. We don't need, we don't need to hear you preaching. Have you ever caught flack? Because you said, I'm going to stand for Jesus. And I'm going to try to lovingly tell other people how they can get to heaven even if they turn their back, even if they reject me, even if they just don't get it, if they just don't understand. Jesus said, <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven belongs to people like that. He takes it a step further because that's what Jesus does when he's got a sledgehammer in his hand. Blessed are you when people insult you. And I'm sure a lot of people are kind of sitting there and they're, you know, this is Jesus is going on for a while. Blessed are people when people insult you. What do you say, hon? I don't know, it didn't make sense to me. And Jesus said again, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of false and evil things about you because of me. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. You know what? I don't always do that. And sometimes when people get after me for following Jesus, I get bent out of shape. I can get self-righteous. I can get angry. But a lot of times, because I have the Holy Spirit, I don't. And I can say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that people are ticked off at me because I'm trying to represent you. Thank you, Lord, that people see enough of you in me that when they want to nail you to a cross, they'd take me up too. You know, they're seeing Jesus in you. What do I always say here? Make sure you're being persecuted for Jesus Christ's sake and not persecuted because you are a doofus. Sometimes we, we, we get, oh, I'm being persecuted because I'm such a mean, ornery, nasty person that other people can't stand to be around. You are not being persecuted for Jesus Christ's sake. You are being persecuted because you're a mean, nasty, ornery person that other people can't stand to be around. So let's, let's be winsome. The gospel offends. The cross says, get on your knees before holy God. The cross is offensive. I don't need to be. I want to be loving. I want to be gracious. 
I want to be winsome. I want to make Jesus Christ attractive in my life, but I'm not going to be so weak with the truth that I'm not actually loving people. In order to love people, I need to bring the full truth. If I'm not bringing the full truth, it's not love. Verse 11 again, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things about you and falsely on account of me rejoice and be glad because your reward is great in heaven. And Jesus just came from heaven. He knows what he's talking about. Rejoice and be glad when the kids at school don't get you because your reward is in heaven. Rejoice and be glad when the other fellows at work laugh at you, think you're a square, when your neighbors don't understand, when your own family doesn't understand, because God sees. God sees. And God's going to bless you. Your reward is great in heaven. And then Jesus said, you know what? They persecuted the prophets in the same way. So you are in good company. When people despise you because of Jesus Christ, remember, they killed the prophets. Why would you think that they're going to accept you? You notice what Jesus is doing, this whole blessed, 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 blessed be, blessed be. Here's how you can be happy. Here's how you can be happy. Here's how you can be happy. He's saying, the way you grew up, the way the world believes you can find happiness, er, take your face away from that and er, start looking at God. Turn your gaze away from this world because this world does not satisfy. Why would we expect it to? Turn our gaze to the world to come. Let's turn now to Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 6. <clears throat> 17 through 23. Some, pa- some Bibles call this section the Beatitudes because they're very similar to what we just studied in Matthew. This one, the Bible calls it the blessings and the woes. And the woes are the opposite of the how to be happies. This is the how to be miserables. He, Jesus, went down with them and stood on a level place. Well, that's a good compromise. It's not a, it's not a plain, it's not a plateau, it's a level place. He went down from the top there. A large crowd of his disciples, uh, a large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon these old Canaanite, these Phoenician cities from years ago, everything's Greek now at the time of this writing, uh, who had come to hear him and to be healed for their diseases. Those who were troubled by impure spirits, we're talking about demons here, they were cured. And the people all tried to touch him because power was coming out from him and healing all of them. Jesus was just radiating this power and healing, and he was preaching the word, and he's bringing truth, and he's bringing healing, and everybody was gathering around him. And this is the message he had for them. Looking at his disciples, and he's talking to this crowd here, he said, blessed are you who are poor. Blessed again, happy. Happy are you when you're poor. That doesn't... How about happy are you when you win the lottery and you're dirty rotten, filthy, stinking rich. (laughs) Blessed are you when you're... What is wrong with Jesus? Jesus, again, I said, this is revolutionary. It's countercultural. It's totally the opposite of what the world thinks. Blessed are you when you're poor. For for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you're hungry now. Blessed are you who hunger now because you're going to be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you. Oh, that hurts, doesn't it? Were you ever the last person chosen when they were divvying up teams? Why in the world do public school systems do that? Here, you're a captain, you're a captain, pick your teams. And then some poor kids are there, and they're the last person chosen. I've been the last person chosen, and, and I was better than those guys. Blessed are you when you're excluded? That's got to hurt. Blessed are you when you're insulted? Well, who likes to be insulted? 
Blessed are you when you insulted and reject your name as evil, when they, when they just think you're a wicked, nasty person because of the Son of God. In other words, they don't think you're wicked or nasty because you did something wrong. They're not insulting you because you committed some crimes or treated some people nastily. They're, they think you're nasty. They think you're wicked, and they're insulting you because you're doing what's right. How does that feel? Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Oh, come off it, Jesus. You know, it's not enough. He just says, you got to be happy about this. He says, why don't you do a little jig? When people insult you, when, when people despise you, when they exclude you, when they th- say you're a bad guy just for following me, Jesus says, rejoice and do a little dance. Dance for joy because great is your reward in heaven because that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Brothers and sisters, we do everything possible to avoid having anybody upset with us. Jesus said, not, again, not upset with us because I'm a more mean, nasty person. Upset with us for the kingdom of God. Jesus said when they reject us because of him, you rejoice. You do a little dance because you're in good company. You're with the prophets. J. Vernon McGee said this verse speaks about the reception of and the attitude towards God's prophets by mankind. The true prophet (coughs) speaks for God and is persecuted. The false prophet prophet misrepresents God and is patronized by men. The true prophet must have faith in God and maintain a quiet confidence which looks beyond the things which are seen to the things which are eternal. That is what keeps a man true to God. The true prophet must have faith in God and maintain a quiet confidence that looks beyond the things in his life right now and looks at the things that are eternal. This is what keeps a man true to God. Why is Christ giving us this hard teaching? Because he likes to hit people with sledgehammers? No, because he knows he's got to break away all that garbage so that we can truly be happy. I want us all to be happy. Taking our focus off of this world, because a man ruled by his flesh will only have eyes for this world. But a man led by the Spirit of God has spiritual eyes and lives for the things of God. If we don't do what Christ is teaching us, if we don't do this, blessed is the man you are poor, but if we don't do these things, we will have a miserable, defeated faith. There will be no joy. There will be no hope. There will be no peace. There will be no reason to expect these things in our lives. Again, coming on verse 23 here. Verse 23, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. The New English Translation, or Net Bible, uh, which is a great translation. It's an online Bible. They're updating it all the time. It has some of the latest uh, scholarship uh, Whenever we dig up something in the ground, there's more uh, archaeological uh, proofs of Scripture or whatnot. It's always uh, put in there. It's a great translation. But the Net Bible points out that Jesus promises condemnation, woe to those who are callous of others, looking only for their own comforts. We have to look away from ourselves to God. James 5, 1 says, come now. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry. Just going back real quick to that uh, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Brothers and sisters, uh, we have to be careful that we're not spending too much energy trying to be accepted by people that are on the highway to hell. Our job is not to make them love us. Our job is to show them the disquieting truth that there is a God, that there is hell to pay, but there is an off-ramp. And Jesus has prepared a way that everybody can find, and there's no difference from the from the greatest sinner to the, to the most wonderful human being, we all need the grace of Jesus Christ. We all need what he did on the cross. And, and we need to be grabbing a hold of people and bringing them over to this less seldom, this less traveled path. There's this big highway, 
Jesus said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, but there's a side road. It's more scenic. It's more beautiful, but it's less trodden. It's, it's less, fewer people go that way. We need to be bringing people with us and going out there, and we're not going to bring people there by hiding our faith and just being accepted and kind of pretending like we're walking along with the crowd. We need to be a voice in the wilderness. We need to be, uh, call out hard and difficult truths, and we need to love people enough to, be, uh, to, to speak with a prophetic voice. Repent. Turn to God. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, let's look at uh, uh, 6 and then verse 24. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. And again, the Net Bible says Jesus promises condemnation. Woe, if it's the opposite of blessing, this is going to be uh, happiness, this is going to be sorrow. Sorrow to those who are callous of others, looking only for their own comforts. Uh, uh, James 5.1 says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl. Come now, you rich, weep and howl aloud over the miseries that are coming on you. Your riches have rotted and your clothing has become moth-eaten. And it's so easy for us to say, well, I'm not rich. Yeah. A lot of us have a car. Some of us have a couple cars. Some of us have cell phones. Some of us have the fancy cell phones. Uh, a lot of us have a roof over our heads. I uh, actually, guys, I lost like uh, six pounds in the last week and a half, so that's good. It was just temporary weight that I added on that run over to Niagara Falls, but it was, felt good this morning to step on the scale and I'm back down. But I am not starving, obviously. Uh, it's so easy for Americans to read this, oh yeah, those rich people, those one percenters, when the whole world, like 80% of the world, is looking at us saying, you rich folks. Your riches have rotted and your clothing has become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver has rusted and their rust will be a witness against you. It will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have hoarded your treasure. Does that make any sense? Look, the pay you have held back from the workers who mowed your fields and cried out against you. This is proper properly treating employees, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived indulgently and luxuriously on the earth. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. A few chapters earlier in James 2, 1 through 5, my brothers and sisters, do not show prejudice if you possess faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if someone comes into your assembly, he's talking about the church, if somebody comes into your assembly wearing a gold ring and fine clothing, and a poor person enters in filthy clothes, do you pay more attention to the one who is finely dressed and say, you sit here in the good place, far away from our pastor? And, and to the poor person, you say, you stand over there up close next to the pastor, or, or sit there on the floor. If so, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? There should be no distinctions between education, between Economy. The only valid distinction is Packers and Bears. Other than that, in the church, <laughs> there should be no distinctions. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, did not God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he promised to those who love him? Uh, woe to us if we're callous and don't think about others. Then uh, Luke 6, 25 through 26. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. Should I read that one again? Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. So we need to be uh, very careful. Our church does some wonderful things with some free meals, with the clothes giveaway, with the children's fair, with, with the rummage sale where everything's in good repair, good shape, and we try to get out there cheaply, uh, cheaply to people. Uh, we've been uh, involved in other ministries here in town, and we, we want to glorify the name of Jesus Christ. We want, we want to do things well so that Jesus Christ is praised. But we need to be careful. What's our ambition here? Well, we want people to think we're good. We want the world to say, well, that's a good church. What does the world always say? The world always says, we need churches to stop preaching and start giving away more free stuff. Then we will accept you. Okay. 
And Jesus said, wait, didn't I die so that you could bring the message? I, I died, right? I took on your sins, and I want to take theirs too. Will you, will you share that message? No, they want free stuff. Watch our motives, because we should be blessing and we should be reaching out to our community. But when people speak well of us, it's a trap, and we have to be careful. When everybody's saying, oh, you're not like those other Christians, it could be a trap. People say that to me. Oh, Dan, you're so nice and reasonable, not like other Christians. I tell them, you know, I'm a lot more like them than you know. But maybe you don't get out enough. You should go meet more Christians. Check our motives. Are, am, is, am I eager? Am I craving people to like me? Am I hungry for the approval of this world? Or is my goal to please my master? Now that ought to have an amen with it. Is our goal to please the master? Oh, come on. Is our goal to please our master? Are we hungry for his approval, his stamp of well done, thou good and faithful servant? Is our goal to win people to a life of faith in submission to our Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. So, brothers and sisters, uh, I know this is a difficult message. In, you know, I'm with C.S. Lewis in this one. Who, who likes Jesus bringing a sledgehammer to us? But why did he bring that? Because he loves us. And he says, now this is how you're going to be happy. Stop looking at the world. Stop looking at stuff. Stop trying to collect things. Stop trying to get the approval of the world. You live for me. You live for me, and it's going to be okay. And you will be satisfied. And I'm going to pour out blessing on you in this life and in the life to come. And this is the path of happiness. And I want our whole church to be people who can stand in the evil day because we're holding on tight to Jesus and we put on that armor. And when the, when the hard days come and we don't like them, we don't have to like them, but when the hard days come, we're not blown away. We don't drift away. We're still standing with Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.